So I'm a new hire into Sport New Zealand and I'm in a role called Insights Consultant. Um, I come from a marketing background predominantly in business development, um, both here and overseas, uh, as well as doing some consultancy work through it. I've had a long-term interest in how you, I'm very much a practical sort of learn as you go on customers type approach, get in, do it, see the feedback and keep going. And that's sort of the approach that I want to kind of instill throughout the presentation and the work I do at Sport NZ. Um, insights, I get a lot of questions about what is insights, what is my role. I've tried to explain it to my wife, I can't, terribly well anyway. Um, I kind of see insights as being, it's about how you layer information together, how you put data and compile it to see sort of what picture it paints um, over time. There's a couple of things that I think about when I think about insights. Insights, uh, kind of when you go, aha, kind of aha moments, or moments where you go, like me, why didn't I think of that? Because it's, sometimes it's really obvious. Other times you actually have to dig quite deep, and you do get stuck down into data, and you have to look and see what's coming through. But the big challenges I see in, in broadly in an insights process is to really understand what's worth looking at, because there's massive amount of information out there. And it's only going to get worse. If we talked about all the technology-driven information, all that sort of environment, more and more data is going to come out, more on the customer, more on who's buying what, more products, more, 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 more. It's actually only going to get harder. And yes, there are lots of software tools being developed that will help you unpick bits and pieces, but you still have to know what you're looking for. And you've got to have good, I do hypotheses before I start anything. What do I think's going on? And can I test it? Am I right, am I wrong through that process? Um, so once you've kind of figured out what's worth looking at, then which bits are relevant? And relevancy is, I think, really key because there's lots of information that's great to know, good to have, but is it relevant for me, for my organisation, for what I'm doing? And that should always be a question you ask because there'll be lots of stuff that just isn't relevant to your particular contexts. And then how do you make the inf information usable? How do you communicate it back to people? Um, and that's often the hardest part of all. How do you tell a really short, coherent story around everything? And I don't think I'm terribly good at it, I'm gonna give it a good go today, but um, telling the story, painting the picture about why you're choosing to do what you're gonna do is, I think, one of the hardest pieces in the whole insight world is how you tell your story. Research and insights are not the same thing. They're different. I'm a massive fan of research and I use it a lot. But it can end up being a bit of a crutch for what you're doing. Because you can keep saying, oh, I'll just keep doing more research. I'll keep digging deeper. I'll keep asking an additional question. There has to be a point at which you become comfortable with the level of information you have and you end up having to make judgment calls. You can dig yourself into very deep holes with research, but research is the one that'll open up the opportunities of where to look. And we're actually incredibly lucky, and I'm, I'm new to Sporting Z. Things like Active New Zealand and YPS are fantastic pieces of research. Don't underestimate what they can do. But I've heard quite a few people say, mm, I'm not so sure about them. It's about how you use research, which bits of information you pull together, and which bits are relevant for what you're doing. They are really worthwhile considering in everything you do. And I've considered them in everything I've done at Sporting Z, because they provide a great context for what's going on. They might not give you all the answers, but a context for how you can progress, start making decisions. And Kay's here. I don't know where Kay is. If people don't know Kay, is Kay in the room at the moment? Oh, yep, hand up. She's got the research desk. She's a fantastic person to touch base with while you're here. Some of the big research pieces are out the back, and she can talk to you and help you um, figure out which bits are the right bits to grab. When I think about Insight, I think it's really about exploration. You, you are looking at a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of information, and then it's about digging in, scratching beneath the surface, figuring out which of those bits do you want to start looking at more. We have not only the Sport NZ information, but we have Statistics New Zealand, which globally is fantastic. There's a huge amount of data in there that's actually pretty readily accessible. It's not all spreadsheets and 
complex bits of information. They've done some great work around providing really insightful information about ethnic groups or about regions or about socioeconomic, around what they like and what they don't like. Ministry of Health, huge amounts of information that they publish, also quite digestible. Um, we've got Ministry of Education. If you want to know what decile schools are within your region, you can actually get all that information it's all available. You can figure out what ethnicities are in what schools, how that's changed over time what subjects people are doing. All that information is sitting there. New Zealand is an environment where there's a lot of public information. But again, we're talking about lots of it. And it's about picking out the bits that you really want to look at. So how to find customer insights. To be fair, it's not always easy. Um, and I would suggest that to date, within six months at Sport NZ, I don't think I've really found any great customer insights yet. I haven't had the chance to ask customers yet. And that's really where you get the, the really good oil on them. But what I want to do is introduce a model about how I'm thinking about um, the insights process. And the model that I want to talk to you about is called the customer insight maturity model. Um, it's a way of, I kind of see it as a way of building a picture in stages. It's not a linear type model. You can jump between bits and pieces. But each part or each stage of the model contributes to another part, adds a bit of information. And it really does start with the big pieces. You know, it starts with strategy, identifying customers, who to focus on, who to think about. Because the reality is we all want to know who our customers are, but which ones do you start with and who do you ask? Because we can't ask everyone. And so it's about understanding which groups do you want to go for first. So the model helps thinking through that sort of process. Um, the model has essentially five stages to it. And it's, this is an adaption of a few other things that are out there quite publicly. So you've got, at the front end, understanding demographic and trends. So what's going on? So of just snapshot and trends. And this is really all about big picture, strategy, and who are you interested in and why. And the information that's available to do that is things like Active New Zealand, Young Persons, Statistics New Zealand. That's the type of information that can be very valuable in pointing out which customer groups you want to think about. And then they are the customers that you then go and understand deeper. So it helps you narrow and focus what you want to look at in terms of customers. Because coming back to it, you can't ask everyone, you can't understand everyone. It takes time to build. So I've been using this approach, and especially those first couple of first three stages within Sport NZ, looking at which participants nationally are we more interested in. Which ones are we concerned about? What trends are really important for what we do? Peter Biggs touched on the Asian community development. That's massive here in New Zealand. Asian communities, he touched on that as well. Massive here in New Zealand. These are big demographic changes. Thinking about how they might be relevant to my sport, my community, is actually a really important starting point because it gives you focus immediately. Um, if we think about aging population, you know, Tauranga, it's a big issue. You've got a whole lot of retirees going up there. How do we keep those people active? More Taco Bell adverts, maybe. Don't know. Um, if you think about Auckland, the, the population changes here are massive. Urbanisation's massive. Um, Asian population changes, new immigrant populations. It's a big issue for Auckland. But it's not as, not as relevant for other regions, and we'll touch on some of that later. But it's really important to consider and ask that question, is that major change relevant for me, my community, my sport. And once you figure that out, then you can go and start understanding deeper into areas. The next bit really starts talking about behaviours and attitudes. What are, the, what are people doing? Why are they doing things that they are? And a lot of your behavioural based stuff, it's already information you hopefully have some of. So which events are people coming to? Who's playing what sports? At what levels? At what grades? This is about understanding and just looking at what people are doing within your sporting context. That's the behaviours. These are the things that they are exhibiting. And then we need to start asking participants questions. We need to start asking them why. What, what's driving your choices of decisions? Getting into attitudes. You know, what do they want? When do they want it? Um, and then the needs. How is the sport meeting the need of the customer? So what's the underlying need? Is it because they want to look good in their swimsuit? Is that the need that a particular person has? And it's going to be different for lots of people. And as you go through the process, you, 
essentially narrowing down on understanding a specific customer. Getting right down to the idea that you're really you're getting down to understanding what the individual is. Now, when I think about that, I think that, well, hang on, how on earth am I going to know every single customer? Well, you're not. You're going to group and you're going to segment customers up based on the idea of shared attitudes, shared needs, so that you can effectively create and develop programs that are going to meet and target those needs and be positioned to them. So this links into some of those marketing messages. What is the need that's really being created that we can then speak to to get that person involved and engaged in sport? Are there any questions so far? Because this was going to be a concurrent session, so it was going to be a little bit less formal, I suppose. Are there any questions so far? Because I feel like I might be going a bit quickly. <laughs> Peter. starts with everyone okay. everyone I a lot of sports I think when this is it's a good question don't just focus focus on asking the people who are currently playing your sport and making decisions on that basis because those people have you're already meeting some of their needs their wants their behaviors focus on the people that are either leaving not coming back or not engaged now it's harder to get to those people that aren't engaged but if you look at your membership people who are participating and going who's leaving Find out why they're leaving. They're the people that you should care, in some ways, as much about as those that are playing. Because you've got to, I think, you know, a lot of things I've got to come to terms with as well is the, the idea that we have to maintain, Peter talked about it this morning, the fact that we have a very successful port sporting nation. So how do we keep that by bringing other groups in as well as maintaining those that are becoming disengaged? So you've kind of got, again, a whole lot of different audiences that you're thinking about. In terms of really getting to people that aren't engaged in sport, hard. It is difficult. But it's about looking at, um, so I, I think about in this process, if we take an example of um, the lower participation rates of Asian communities um, in Auckland, well, actually nationally, they participate lower. And I'm going to run through an example of that, and hopefully that'll show you sort of how you can begin narrowing down and actually making some decisions around what you put out into the marketplace that might meet some of their needs, that whole learning and development approach. So you put out something that is likely to put your best foot forward rather than no foot forward at all to a group that may not be engaging. So there's an example that will come through as we go through this. Are there any others at this stage? Okay, I'll keep moving on. Um, so what I want to do for the rest of the presentation is really run through a practical example, really looking at these first three stages. And the reason why only really looking at the first three is because the last two really involve actually asking customers. I haven't been out and asked your customers. You've got some ideas of who they are, what they want and need. The process really into um, the idea of attitudes and needs is really driven off actually asking them why they're participating, why they're on the sideline, why they're coaching and understanding what are those drivers behind those attitudes and needs. But at this stage, this is really that top level picture of how to figure out who you're gonna ask and maybe what you wanna put to people out in the marketplace that aren't yet engaging. So that information is generally what I'd say is freely available information to make some pretty good decisions about what you wanna deliver to who and where they might be. So the process as far as I'm concerned always starts with the big trends, big picture stuff. and. I've got, a, I've got a few bits and pieces that I want to just touch on as we go through. And this information was built from a whole lot of sources, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Active New Zealand, YPS, Statistics New Zealand, to start building an understanding of what are some of these things are, are going on. Urbanisation nationally is occurring faster than population growth. Basically, um, non-urban areas aren't growing in population and they're ageing. That's going to be a challenge. Ageing population, we had talk, talked about ageing populations earlier. You've got, um, you might have sports structures that have um, networks of regions and clubs. Some of those are going to struggle with this dynamic over time. 
that re it's a bigger strategic question, I think, for a lot of sport. What do you do about the, the changing demographic in your urban areas, as well as your rural areas? So this is what we know that makes this important for us to consider. Physi physical activity is lower in urban areas for kids. Urban children are less likely to participate in a school team, and there's pressure for urban areas to adapt to changing ethnic diversity. Those things are all going to impact on sport. Low socioeconomic communities are exhibiting behaviours and have barriers that would appear to be lowering their, lowering their participation. So what we know, high deprivation areas have lower participation rates, straight out of the latest uh, Active New Zealand survey. Low decile secondary schools have consistently lower participation rates than high decile schools. People in the lowest income group have experienced a significant decline in participation, again, straight from Active NZ, the latest one that's just come out. Children living in the most deprived areas were three times as likely to be obese. So that's going to create a barrier for them to participate. The ethnic makeup of New Zealand is changing and will require the New Zealand sporting system to adapt. Asian ethnicities are growing faster than any other ethnic groups. And a lot of the stuff shouldn't be a surprise to people. We should all know that these, some of these big, bigger trends are going on. By 2021, Asian Pacific and Maori was re represent over 50% of Auckland's population, something that Peter alluded to earlier. The median personal income of Asians is lower than that of Māori and only slightly above that of Pacifica. Indians within the Asian community have poorer risk factors and profiles for several major health concerns. 27% of Pacifica children were obese and Asian ethnicity participation is lower. So biggest, fastest growing ethnic group, it's made up primarily of um, uh, Chinese and Indians, sorry. Um, communities. The Indian community is growing faster than the Chinese and is going to pass and they are considered Asians. What is this going to mean? And they've got bad health factors as well. What role do we have? What role do we have to think about? Asian is, is not a simple fix in any way, shape or form. Lifestyles of young people have changed and are continuing to change. Again, this is linking into some of the commentary earlier. Young females participate less and have an obesity rate that is increasing and have different needs to boys. Right, so the key things. There was a significant decline in participation rates of 16 to 24 year olds. Again, that, I think that was, and Kay can correct me if I'm wrong, of all the age groups that was the only one that showed a significant decline within the latest active NZ survey. Young females are less active than males and become more inactive with age. Um, young females need experiences that meet their emotional, mental, social, as well as physical needs. Look, it's the same for boys, but these are different groups. They have different needs that want in there, um, in that mix. Increasing options for sedentary behaviour. You know, my kids have got iPods. Great. How do I, how do I take them off them? Um, and there's a large step up in obesity in girls between 10 and 14 year olds and 15, 24 year olds. So I want to have a quick look at how these can influence what we do. And this is kind of an example I want to run through of information that's out there that you can use to start thinking about what's going on and what you might want to do about it. I want to come back to this point I've made a couple, couple of times. Keep in mind, is this important, relevant to my community or sport? The example I have will be in some cases, won't be in others. But that's a question that you should always ask when any of this sort of information comes up and by asking it, in my mind, you're asking yourself, well, what is relevant to my community or my sport? Which is a, a great place to always start whenever you're thinking about this sort of stuff. Um, so I want to look at the Asian population growth. Um, and really, it's going to be primarily looking at the demographic uh, and trend information, then looking a little bit at what we know about behaviours associated with sport. So the question is, is the Asian trend relevant to everyone? And it's a bit of a graph. It's nasty and horrible to read, but what you have is you have the bar graph that talks about percentage of population. Does this have a laser on it? I don't know. Essentially, population percentage is on the axis on this side, closest to me on this one, and the bar's going up with the percentage of population. 
So this is from 2013, Auckland region, the second one, 22% is Asian. The little darker blue dots represent the percentage change in that population going on. So there's two things to look at. How big is the population? How much is it changing? If you looked at other populations in New Zealand, those little blue dots wouldn't all be across the line. So Asian ethnicity is increasing in every region of New Zealand, according to stats in 2013. Okay, that's quite interesting. But in some regions, you know, what's the last one? In the Southland region, it's increasing, I think, 140 odd percent, but it's still a very small part of the population. So maybe it's not relevant to other things that are going on. You have to look at it in a broader context. What else is happening in the Southland region? Maybe it's the changes in socioeconomic status that's more important. Maybe it's the ageing population that's more important. But this one, you know, you've had a look and what does it tell you? So the question is, is it relevant? Well, yes, but there's a but. <laughs> um, yes, it's relevant. It's certainly in the New Zealand context um, because it's increasing, Asian population is increasing every region of New Zealand and we know that they have lower participation rates. But population in a given region might be small, may not be relevant. Is it relevant in Auckland? I'd say absolutely. A large proportion of the population is here and it's growing rapidly. So to impact on Asian communities, what else do I need to know? What other information might be available? So we know it's a, take it as written, it's a major trend that's changing in New Zealand. Well, how do I find them? Well, it's actually quite easy. There's maps available online where you can look at different ethnic groups and where they're, where they're concentrated. This is an example from Wellington. And what, it, what Stats has kindly made available to everyone is a way to look at your community, pick the ethnicity that you're interested in, and it'll darken areas where that uh, ethnicity is concentrated. And in this case in Wellington, in that region up the, the, the top blue circle, that has about 40% Asian population in Wellington, in that one area. So you can start looking at your communities in that way. Interesting things about Asian communities, they often congregate together in certain areas. And it'll be within sub-ethnicities as well. So, sorry, going back. So we can, we, not, we can find out where our population groups are, be it socioeconomic, age, ethnic basis. That's doable. And there's tools available online, readily available if you want to look at where, where these people are. How might it affect a club? How might it affect what an RST wants to do in a region? If you're going to put a club in, in a certain area, do you understand what the population groupings are within that area? Or if a club is changing it and its participation rates are dropping down, it might be that the ethnic diversity of that region is shifting away from an interest in that sport. So what do Asian populations want to try or do? This stuff is from YPS and a little bit from um, Active NZ. The ones that are circled for boys in blue, girls in pink, and then adult population and uh, it's a slightly different one. But just look at the first two. These are sports they're more interested in doing, but they're not. So if you looked at a comparison to means what they were playing and what they're actually interested in doing, some things come up that are quite interesting. Um, so this is from YPS. Um, I think it's really interesting about rugby um, and the Asian population. They're not playing it, but they're interested in playing it. So what might rugby have to think about in terms of, well, there's a population group, but they may not want to play rugby in the setting that's there. They may not want to play with people twice their size. You know, does, and, you know, I'm just shooting off the cuff here, does rugby have to think about a uh, weight-based league for uh, older people? I don't know. In terms of, will that be a way that you might be able to engage Asian boys in playing a sport where they're not going to get crushed by people twice their size? You know, look, I'm broadly generalising, but it's some of these thought processes are all available from the public information. The, the one on the far right, um, adults, popular activities that are different from other ethnicities. So you've got badminton, cricket and football are more popular, and this is amongst the older, playing, older populations, so 16 plus, for Asian ethnicities. Okay, so we actually got a, a reasonable idea of what sports might, we might want to pitch to them or talk to them about. These are existing sports, so there's always other dynamics around action sports or new sports coming, but these are ones that we can start thinking about what might resonate if we want to uh, communicate or engage with those populations. 
then how are populations interested in participating? Again, this is available from the research. Clubs, they're least likely of all ethnicities to look at it. They're least likely to do it in school teams. They're least likely to volunteer. It's very important to them to participate socially and with family and friends. Um, they were less likely to do it competitively, um, but they had a higher interest in trying new sport or recreation activities. So immediately I start thinking about, well, how does our existing sporting structures and the way we operate in the sport context meet with the needs of these groups? And again, some of this may not be new, but this, this information's out there. These are what research has shown us. This is all research-based information about what we have to think about. So again, we're just building a picture of uh, what's going on within this community to help inform decisions. So we have quite a lot of information about them. We know that the population is growing rapidly. We also know that they don't participate very much. So if we want to be the most successful sporting nation and keep high participation rates, we're going to have to do something about the Asian population. We know where they are, so we can actually find them into where they live. Um, we know what they're interested in, and we know how they like to participate. So that's a lot of information that we know if we want to look at the Asian communities. And we can do this for any part of the country, any ethnicity we want to, any age group. This information is all available. It's about cutting and slicing the information the right way to create a picture that's relevant to a given region or area. For any sport, for any RST, for any council, uh, any territorial authority. Uh, but hang on, there's a whole lot of other stuff that become important to consider. There are actually 15 different Asian ethnicities in New Zealand. Two are dominant, Chinese and Indian. The Indian is growing faster than the Chinese, as I mentioned. Um, Asian populations are concentrated in urban areas. So again, from a, from a rural context, probably less of an issue to consider. Um, and when we talk about Asian populations being concentrated, they are generally concentrated on ethnic lines. That's what it is today. It may not be like that tomorrow. You might find that um, they become more integrated, I suppose would be the word. I'm not saying they're not, but they might not be clustered as much over time. But right now they're clustered. What actually makes them, as a group, relatively easy to identify where they live and what you might want to do about them. Um, Indian socioeconomic status looks to be lower and their health outcomes are worse. So there might be opportunities to work in with other groups into that, into that sector. So Indian populations have the lowest health outcomes of any ethnic minority in New Zealand. So Chinese population does appear to be more clustered than the Indian population. And Chinese and Indian populations have different sporting preferences, which shouldn't be a surprise either. Now, sometimes research takes us to a level. So YPS inactive don't go down necessarily into Indian and Chinese, and Statistics New Zealand doesn't necessarily go down into Indian and Chinese. But you're looking at other information that might be available to help build you a picture to then start making, uh, making some decisions. So I think, damn it, it can get quite complex. Um, and you can keep digging, and keep digging, and keep digging, and keep digging, and keep digging forever. Um, but you have to make some judgment calls. And a lot of this information, I think, is at a point where you can make judgment calls and say, well, okay, we're going to try this. We're going to look at that. We're going to go to this community and ask them, because we know where they are. They might be interested in these things. Are these the things to start with and think about? I know this isn't, well, it might be readable. Um, I just did a quick flick up of something for Wellington, looking at a couple of things around socioeconomic status and Asian ethnicity. And I was trying to think about if I had to communicate what I was going to do, how would I do that? What sort of information would I need to be saying and telling? And you know, where are the Asian communities? Where are the low income communities? How, that's 30% of school kids um, have below average participation in Wellington. We can identify the schools that they are involved in. Um, so it's low income um, and Asian, Asian areas. Obesity is increasing in low income areas. Um, Asian populations are growing rapidly in Wellington. So this is sort of a Wellington story. Um, and then you can start putting some size around this. How many kids are we talking about? 
How do we want to then invest our money and our resources into these different areas? Um, what might we want to deliver and put into the schools or support through KiwiSport or whatever it is into these different areas? You can start creating a picture, but then you can communicate out and say, hey, look, this is what we're doing. As a, as a way that I think about things. It may not work for your communities or anyone else, but you can paint pictures that clearly say, this is what we're thinking about and this is what we're going to be thinking about doing. And then I had some questions that flowed through my mind that I thought about asking. Um, how well do your communities, your sport, know about what's changing? You know, are people really aware of how big these dynamics are going to be? You know, the, the youngest quartile of New Zealand population is not going to change over the next 40 years. The numbers, literally the number of young people in New Zealand is not really going to change. The number of old people are going to change over the next 40 years. 40 plus years, out to 2060, and change massively. Are communities aware of that? Are they aware about the, how the ethnic changes, ethnicity is changing within Auckland, how that might impact a sport, how might, how might that impact um, uh, delivery regionally? How do you go about gathering this information and then sharing it back? Are there any particular barriers to putting this information out there? What would be the the risks, that's something I'm really interested in, personally, understanding what, what would stop this sort of information being made available publicly. Um, you know, do you understand what, what impact your investments are having? We can identify exactly where people are. If you want to go for someone, you can demonstrate, saying, hey, look, we've done something here to this community for this particular impact. Um, and how have you leveraged those successful campaigns in d different regions to other parts of the country? I'm thinking about sort of active communities as an example, how they're being leveraged. I know there's been some great work done with Asian, Asian communities. Are other people thinking about how they can pick that up and use that? These are sort of open questions that I, I think about. Um, the next is all about asking the participant, understanding their attitudes and needs. But I'm not going to go into that here today. Um, I am doing some work inside Sporting Z with a couple of uh, organisations looking at how, what approach might we take to talking to our, to our members and not members? And that sort of information that I'll be bringing back out to everyone over time as that work develops and evolves. Um, that's it for me. I know I'm not quite Spencer Willis, um, but I hope at least I was um, not too much of a, a poor substitute. Um, but if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to take them um, now from the floor. I am round for the next day or well, day and a half, so I'm more than happy to have a chat to different people about different things if they're interested. Mr. Howard. Um, so I suppose that sport, looking at this stuff, uh, takes a certain amount of skill and understanding about access this type of information um, to support your strategic or planning decisions. How do I get it? What's the easiest way for me to actually access this stuff to support my own planning? Uh, I just for the record, he is from Sport New Zealand. I didn't ask him to ask a question. Um, so um, I'm going to put something up online with a few examples and a few web links for information. Um, I have been asked a few times um, around, oh, look, do we need an insights person? Do we need somebody that's doing this for us? Um, I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I think certainly um, the view I'd have is we probably need more people within the sector that might think about things in this way. Um, one of the things that I am looking to do is actually to provide some tools to help. Over the next six months, I expect to be bringing out some what I call beta trial tools to really help you look and segment and understand your communities at that high level from the demographic, trends and behavioural piece. So that's combining this information into something that's really usable and digestible. So that is something that I'll be following up with. Um, I don't know if that, does that kind of answer your question, Dave? Uh, yeah, I'm sensing a little bit of wait and see. Um. Well, I suppose the information I'll provide available will point you to where all the resources are that you need to do it. To, and I can put some examples in in terms of how the picture's being painted or how you could go about it. And I'm available if people want to be in touch and ask, or I can do QA or, or whatever to support through the process. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, the last speaker talked about co-creation. Where, where do you see the whole notion of co-creation within the gathering of insights? Because I, I, I suppose I pick up some challenges that we have in terms of, you know, do 
coming into that community, going and get it from them around, I'm sort of thinking, where does the ownership in terms of which of those communities sit? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, so this is very interesting. Um, I've had a couple of really good conversations around the whole community development type approach. What I've talked about here at the, at the start is really just about identifying which communities you might want to engage with, which ones are a higher priority in a lot of ways for you to consider. The engagement piece and what you develop and deliver, it's kind of, it's kind of coming half ready, is kind of how I'd describe it, and then working in with the community to understand the attitudes and needs around what you deliver. So I'd see it as quite complementary, but it's about you can't, again, come back to, I come back to you, can't ask everyone. You've got to understand and decide who you want to work with and engage with that's going to deliver to what the priority for your sport is or for your community to deliver the right, those right outcomes. So I see them as complementary in terms of that process. It's sort of self-arming. Is that? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, it creates a challenge around, again, if I, I use my own experience around the Māori community, you know, again, you've got to work can't just go and talk to them, you actually got to have some credibility in that space of them because they want to know, well, who, who are you and where do you come from before they even open up. So I, I do agree, I think there's some complementarity within that approach. I suppose I was just trying to add some aspect to that because I think that area is, is, far, is quite important yeah. in terms of that community development and model approach. Yeah, I suppose one thing I haven't really touched on is that, you know, this stuff is... I suppose very much data driven. There's all the stuff that you guys bring to it from your experience, uh, your engagement, your understanding of your customers to create the actual complete picture. This is, this is a very much a kind of a siloed square view picture of the world. It's about using that information in the right way and adding in what you already know to create a bigger and broader picture about what's going on within your sport or within your community. Uh, not very far. I, I see a lot of sport being delivered in the same ways that it's already always been done, um, and I think that's a massive challenge. Um, yeah, I would I would have said not that not that far along. I, I would agree. So the, the way I'm thinking about it, and I'd like to be moving faster than I am within, within the environment, is let's be really clear on, on who we want to target first and who we want to understand. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of just getting out and doing stuff, going and talking to that community, asking them. I think a couple of things that I'm really conscious of is that we've got to work together to solve the problem. And how do we create an environment where the information and learnings becomes very shared? Because at the end of the day, it's not about a sport, it's about an individual and what they want to do. And they might want to do 15 different sports. We can't hold on to the individual. We have to, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm not in a sport, I'm at Sport NZ, I can have this luxury, but I think actually much broader around how do we keep people involved in whatever they want to be involved in rather than involved in one particular thing. Because needs change over time and through people's lives. 